Friends, keep your Bibles open uh, at that passage, and I'm going to pray. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time of which God had spoken to him. Father, as we look into your word this morning, help us to see you, that we may see ourselves, and by the Holy Spirit, our lives may be transformed for the glory of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. For those that know me, I tend to walk a little quickly. Uh, my life is kind of very fast-paced. Uh, I don't like to wait. I'm one of those people that when you go to the deli bar to go get those little paper numbers, you know the ones, you know, and you arrive there and it's number 152, right? You pull it out and you go, okay, 152, and you look up and the sign's at 10, you're kind of going, no, this is not good. I'm sure I can get the rest of my groceries done while I wait. I'm impatient. I'm very grateful that we live in a culture at the moment that is all about while you wait, fix it. You know those things, you know, while you wait, fix your shoes, same dental, day uh, dental. I'm very thankful for Amazon. Hey, how about that? You can order a book in the morning and potentially you get it that afternoon, certainly the next day, and sometimes even on a Saturday, which is great if you forget a birthday. I actually feel for Abraham, for those who've been here over the many weeks since we've started this little series, I actually feel for Abraham. Imagine poor Abraham, back in chapter 12, 75 years old, 75 years old, and he's told, you will have a child. You're going to have a great nation. You're going to have a great land. And the world is going to be blessed through you. What an extraordinary thing. But as we've seen over these many weeks... He has had to wait. Some 25 years later, we'll see today that child arrive. 25 years of waiting. He was already 75 years old. He was already past the age of having children, he and Sarah. They're not getting any younger, but God kept on putting it off. 25 years years. Why the wait? Why didn't God just at, the, at chapter 12 give Abraham and uh, Sarah Isaac then? Well, I take it it's God's kindness. God wants to teach Abraham and through him us important lessons about himself and ourselves. And today is no different Abraham, we saw last time that we met, thinking about Abraham, in chapters 18 and 19, it was a high point for Abraham as he prayed over Sodom and Gomorrah and prayed for the salvation of, of Lot. That would have been the point, surely, at the beginning of chapter 20. But no, we've got this chapter 20 before us. Why? I think it's so that we can learn two important lessons the first lesson we're going to have a look at is the very great peril of inconsistency. The second lesson we're going to learn is the very great blessing of aligning, aligning yourself with God's chosen one. Two lessons we learn while waiting. But then we'll see that final point, the very great joy of God's fulfilled promises. So let's think about the very first lesson that we're going to learn this morning from our text in chapter 20, the very great peril of inconsistency. Now, I'm not much of a golfer. I go out very rarely, but uh, being a good golfer lies not in the ability to make a few great shots, but the ability to make very few bad ones. It's true, isn't it? I mean, I love going out there and you get that one sweet shot. 
And you go, yeah, I'm back. I'm ready. Here I go. I'm going to do this again. And then the rest of the game is rubbish. Great golfers know how to be consistent. In other words, in relation to doing anything well, consistency is the key. And whenever inconsistency creeps in, then we find that we're not what we would desire ourselves to be. And in relation to matters of faith, then we are not what God intends us to be. Today's passage opens up with Abraham and his wife and all that are with him travelling south. Have a look there in chapter 20, verse 1. From there, Abraham journeyed toward the territory of the Negev and between the Kadesh and Sur, and he sojourned, sojourned in Gerar. A new sitting, a new setting, a new situation, a new place and new opportunities for Abraham. Uh, the challenge was, of course, for him, as he faced these new challenges, would he walk the walk of faith or will he walk the route of fear? seeking to deal with this new situation by his own human ingenuity. Have a look at verse 2. And Abraham said to his wife, uh, said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. What an astonishing thing. What a terrible inconsistency in the life of faith. It seems incredible that Abraham should make the same dreadful mistake that he made in chapter 12. For those who are here, you remember that, don't you? Going into Egypt and saying the same things and the king of Egypt taking Sarah to be a part of his harem. Here we are again. This time... Abimelech sees Sarah from afar. He takes her to be his wife and into his harem. Now, back in chapter 12, we might excuse Abraham because at that stage he had a little experience of God's providential care over him, but he's now years older, some 24 plus years older and richer in experiences of seeing God deliver. It's amazing to find Abraham here, fearing for his life. The righteous prophet who boldly pleaded for the salvation of Sodom is now discovered to be less than perfect in his trust of God's safekeeping. Indeed, when challenged by Abimelech, he resorts to lying, claiming he describes Sarah as his sister wherever he went. Abraham, you see, as he comes into this new environment, in light of his friendship of God, he should have put his place and trust in God. But instead, he goes back to his old scheme. Notice the impact of his inconsistency. Notice the impact of it as it ripples out like a, like a pond, a, a pebble thrown into a pond as the ripples go further and further. Think, first of all, of Sarah, his wife. As uh, as we noted in chapter 12, Abraham here again puts his wife in moral danger. Listen to the way that he explains it to Abimelech in verse 13. And when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is a kindness you must do to me. At every place to which we come, say of me, he is my brother. And this has got to be one of the most unbelievable statements in the Bible made by one of the spiritual giants, isn't it? He says to his wife, look, if you want to show your love for me, then uh, uh, please say that you're just my sister. By doing so, he puts his marriage relationship in jeopardy every time. Why? Why do this? Because as he moved constantly from from the path of faith to the realm of fear. Have a look 
as what he says to Abimelech in verse 11. I did it because I thought there is no fear of God at all in this place and they will kill me, be, be, kill me because of my wife. Here is the best of men you see, but he is still just a man. And so he pretends that Sarah is not his wife, but his sister. It's a half-truth, and therefore it's a lie. But moreover, my friends, feel the weight of this moment. As Abraham uses Sarah for his own safety, it becomes a dangerous deception, jeopardizing, again, the paternity of the promised son. The world's salvation The great promises of God are again at jeopardy. Here is this great pioneer of faith, the giant of faith, Hebrews chapter 11 talks about him, faltering over a relative small danger because he was gripped with fear. How true to life that is. Secondly, Notice the inconsistency that Abraham's effect has on the house of Abimelech. Look there in verse 3. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, you are a dead man, because the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. You are a dead man. God speaks to Abimelech and says, You're dead. You've taken the, the woman... Uh, taken um, a woman who was already married. It's interesting as we follow the little uh, dialogue that happens between Abimelech and God there, uh, you know, Abimelech uh, you know, panics. You know, I didn't realize that she wasn't, yeah, that she was married. Uh, God says, fair enough, uh, I know you, are, you haven't slept with her, but you need to, get back to Ab- need to get her back to Abraham as quick as possible. And get him to pray for you, or you are in trouble. Although Abimelech was safe from adultery by the hand of God, as verse 6 makes clear, we're told in verse 18 that he was a dead man because God had closed the wombs of the house of Abimelech on account of the action he had taken. So in other words, in relation to these events, suddenly in Abimelech's harem within his family structure, no one's having babies. There is death in the family. And the reason? Abraham's inconsistency. Listen as Abimelech brings Abraham in and he says to him in verse 9, What have you done to us? How have I sinned against you? What, that you have brought me and my kingdom a great sin. You have done to me things that ought not to have been done. And we heard Abraham's feeble and unconvincing excuses. As we've seen. They will kill me because of my wife. Verse 12. Besides, she's indeed my sister, the daughter of my father, though not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. When God caused me to wander from my father's house, I said to her, this is a kindness you must do for me at every place to which we come. Save me, he is my brother. He is guilty of wrong thoughts. And these wrong thoughts lead inevitably to wrong actions. It's interesting, isn't it, that while he reports to Abimelech that Abimelech did not fear God, it's evident as we read this that Abimelech did fear God. And secondly, that Abraham feared many of the things more than he feared God. The one one who is called to faith and fear models faithlessness and fearlessness. So he's guilty of selfishness. He wanted to spare his life and the others were just used in this regard. He was guilty of fear. He was more afraid of Abimelech than the living God. Friends, I wonder if you, like me, know that there are inconsistencies that just lurk in the background. I wonder, friends... 
whether there are inconsistencies in our life. When we face new circumstances, how do we react? We suddenly get the news of unemployment. Suddenly our routine visit to the doctor turns out to be not so routine. Suddenly our teenage children that we thought were absolutely rock solid arrive home telling us we've been skating. They've been skating on thin ice for a long time. Suddenly our husband or our wife, our closest friend has failed us at some juncture along the way. Suddenly our best friends move. It's a new environment. It's a new challenge. It's a new chapter. It's a new day. What are we going to do? What Abraham forgot is what we often forget. Abraham forgot that God knows about every change. And he knows he can be trusted. It's easy to trust God while things are well. But in times of disappointment, in times of loneliness, in times of uncertainty, in a new environment, the inconsistencies of our heart may well be revealed. It's okay here, isn't it, when we're on Sunday? When the band is playing those songs and our hearts are filled with joy. But it's all different, isn't it? When we go into the office, we go into the college, we go into the classroom, we're on public transport. And there we wrestle with our sins of faith. Friends, it might just take one little unforgiven sin, one little piece of pride held onto, one little half-truth in your life that many people are affected detrimentally. We cannot allow that. For God's glory is at stake. And that's what Abraham forgot. Yet, friends, the thing that surprises me greatly is as we look at this passage... It's Abraham that brings blessing. Here's the surprising truth. The very great blessing of aligning yourself with God's chosen one is where you will receive great blessing. Did you notice it? Despite Abraham's terrible inconsistency, yet Abimelech is completely dependent upon Abraham. Have a look in verse 6. Then God said to him in his dream, Yes, I know that you have done this in your integrity of your heart, and it was I who kept you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now then, return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, so that he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not return her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours." So Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told them all these things. And the men were very afraid. The one who lied, uh, the, who had tried to put a positive spin onto it, is the one that God works through. It's not his virtue, a- Abraham's virtue. It's the God of promise. Abraham is chosen by God, not because of the words which... Not by words which are lacking, not even faith which is feeble, only by God's incredible grace. The weakness of both men is evident, but God's grace overrules it all. It overrules with Abimelech and keeping him from sleeping with Sarah. It overrules with Abraham, creating, um, continuing to use him to bring about his purposes by using Abraham as his prophet. Look at the responses very quickly. Then in verse 14, then Abimelech took sheep and oxen and male servants and female servants and gave them to Abraham and returned Sarah to his wife. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. To Sarah, he said, behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. It is a sign of your innocence in the eyes of all who are with you and before everyone you are vindicated. I hear the Bible wants us to be really clear that in Abimelech giving all this silver, he wants people to know that the baby that is to arrive in chapter 21 is not Abimelech's, but Abraham's. Look at Abraham's response. We see in verse 17, then Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech. 
and also healed his wife and female slaves so they bore children. For the Lord had closed the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Here we see the dead man and his family saved. Who through, of all people, God working through Abraham. It's interesting, isn't it? That here we see Abraham as a prophet. This is the first time that we come across this in the Old Testament. God using, uh, God's uh, chosen one, the prophet. The one in whom all the blessings that would come. Uh, friends, if you jump back just a few pages, back to, back to page 9. We see there that this prophetic intercessor, the, the one that God gave promises to, if you look there in verse 3, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Here we see an outsider, Abimelech, and his family being blessed, being saved through Abraham. But we've already seen this before. Back in chapter 16, God, uh, Abraham prays over Ishmael. And we see great blessing there. We see um, in Sodom uh, and Gomorrah, Lot, Abraham praying and Lot spared, God sparing Lot. It's the same true here where we see God blessing the world outside because of Abraham praying. Friends, this is a warning to us. We need to line ourselves with God's promises. We need to be connected to the ones God has chosen. We need to align ourselves with God's great plan of salvation. Friends, we need to align ourselves with Jesus. We need to throw our lot in with him, side with him, because God will bless those who align themselves with him. Friends, we need to encourage those in our city, those that we know, our family and our friends. We've got the life course coming up. Here is a great way to help people align themselves with Jesus. Why? Because that is where blessing is found. Well, friends, we've seen a very great peril. We've seen a very great blessing. But both came about because of our third and final point. Because the very great joy of God's fulfilled promises. Despite Abraham and his, uh, his inconsistency, here we see God bringing about life. Have a look with me at chapter 21. The Lord visited Sarah, and as he said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. Can you imagine that extraordinary moment of Abraham holding little Isaac? 25 years because of God's great promise, God's great kindness, God's great grace. Here is little Isaac. Notice though, three times at the beginning, God said, God promised, and it happened just as he had spoken. We should not be surprised, friends. The big lesson here is, is that God, when God says something, it will happen. It may not happen that same day delivery that we want, but it will happen. This birth is not brought about natural processes. Here we see the power and overriding importance of the promise in these narratives. We live in a world of reason. But here, here we see an unexplicable event, except but by the promises of God. 
a man and a woman as good as dead, as Hebrews said, given life. Friends, it's very easy for us to, uh, in the midst of waiting, as we wait and, and feel like nothing is happening, to go back to our own resources. Or if we don't have our own resources, then, we, then we're driven to despair. But friends, here is the God of promise. I love the way that in this next little section we see here this play on laughing. They called him Isaac, meaning he laughs. Uh, Here we see the laughter of unbelief in the chapters before. Here we see now the laughter of joy by the power of God's word. God has broken the grip of death, hopelessness and childlessness. There is now joyous laughter at the end of weeping and sorrowing. Here we see a receiving a newness that cannot be explained, a sheer gift, a gift of grace. It is surprising. But as we follow this family line, as we follow God's great plan of salvation through this Isaac. You might like to very quickly jump to Matthew chapter 2 on page 807. I hear we see this genealogy. Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob and we keep on following it all the way through. We jump down to verse 17. So the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. The Christ, the one whom would bring life, the forgiveness of sins, the one who we align ourselves with, we can have grace and life. We can be taken from being dead people to given life. Friends, here's a great moment of rejoicing. Great joy found in the promises of God. Friends, very quickly jump to the final passage that we heard just a little while ago from 2 Peter chapter 3, page 1019. Let me conclude with these words. Page 1019. Chapter 3, verse 9, uh, verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved. That with the Lord one day is is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But that day of the Lord will come like a thief, And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and and dissolved and the earth and the words that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, uh, uh, dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Friends, we're going to conclude by praying. We're going to do that in the words of Jude. I wonder if you would stand. Friends, let's pray this prayer for ourselves and for each other. In the words of Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, Through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory. Now and forever. Amen.